major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, September 9th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. We are finally getting much needed rain, but it's coming with some concerns, like how much and along with some howling winds at times. And while there is a break to the sweltering week-long heat, officials are calling for caution once again. KPBS reporter Tanya Thorne with more on this incoming storm. Strong winds and rain didn't stop Carlsbad resident Oliver Gertzky from catching some waves this morning. Perfect weather for surfing, feels like tropical and uh, offshore winds, barreling, four to six, 75 degree water, couldn't ask for it any better. While avid surfers like Gertzky enjoy this weather, others may be really uncomfortable says meteorologist Alex Tardy. Yeah, it's going to feel muggy because we're we're in very tropical direct moisture from tropical cyclone K is moving in right now and is going to linger throughout the weekend. So when the sun comes out a little bit on Saturday and Sunday, it'll feel downright sticky. As Hurricane K passes off the coast of Baja California, strong winds and rain are expected in San Diego on and off throughout the weekend. It's so close that it's bringing widespread rain. Some of that rain is going to be too heavy. Um, so we could see some urban flooding. We could see some flooding in our mountains and certainly in our desert areas uh, like Borrego Springs. To help San Diego residents prevent flooding, a limited supply of sandbags will be available at these locations. Officials urge residents to be proactive around their homes and pick up any debris, keep trash and recycle bins closed, and turn off irrigation systems during the rain. For those planning to drive this weekend, Officer Chris Baldonado with the California Highway Patrol offers some tips. If you have a trip coming out this weekend, plan your trip. Uh, pay attention to our roadways, um, pay attention to traffic, have a plan B, because you might be stuck in traffic and then everyone's you know, trying to get from point A to point B and losing patience. So we may obviously make sure that your vehicle is well equipped with gas, proper fluids, proper inflation of the tires, and that you yourself as a driver is properly rested, um, you're properly hydrated, and just plan for traffic. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. The most recent forecast track shows Tropical Storm K weakening before it heads offshore tomorrow. We'll have more on the storm's expected impact here in San Diego coming up in your complete weather forecast. It's the 10th and possibly final day we're all being asked to reduce our power use. The California Independent System Operator issued another flex alert for 4 o'clock until 9 o'clock tonight. The nightly calls to cut back electricity use have worked with the Cal ISO avoiding any calls for rolling power outages. And a reminder, you can save power by setting thermostats to 78 degrees, avoiding using major appliances, turning off unnecessary lights, and avoiding charging electric vehicles. We're getting the first look at a new homeless shelter in the Midway District that's set to open early next week. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman shows us inside. This unassuming tent structure in the back lot of the county health complex is where the city and county's newest homeless shelter is. The layout of this shelter is very similar to other ones in the city of San Diego. This one has 150 beds. You can see these bunk beds laid out all about, but this one's a little bit different. It's going to have 24 hour intakes. With the goal of having this be a transition, someone comes in, they get help, they get assistance, we find them a placement, we free up a bed for somebody else to come in. Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says the city is paying for the shelter's operation while the county is providing the location and contracting with Vista Hill for on-site mental health services. We know that uh, no one shelter is going to solve every problem that we face, but it's another step in the right direction. With 150 beds, San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria says the city's total shelter capacity is now around 1,600 beds. 
He says more temporary housing options are coming, including non-congregate spaces. We know that our throughput currently is not sufficient to meet the incoming flow of people who are becoming homeless, but I'm undeterred, and as I'm, while I'm as frustrated as every other San Diegan, I choose to channel that frustration to solutions like this one, uh, not to throw my hands up and suggest that there's no solution to this. There are. It's more housing with services. Gloria says the Midway community has been frustrated with an increasing number of unsheltered residents. The nonprofit Alpha Project Project has been tapped to run this new shelter. They operate two similar size shelters downtown, but this is the only large one outside of the downtown core. My expectation is going to go well. Uh, once the, you know, we, we, we don't call these shelters. I know everybody else calls them shelters. We call them communities because they are. Alpha Project CEO Bob McElroy also runs a smaller shelter just down the street on Sports Arena Boulevard. He's been doing outreach in the Midway area, getting ready for Monday's opening. We already know who our, most of our folks are out there. They know that they're coming in. And we're going to go out and literally find them and pick them up on Mondays and start welcoming people in. They've got hygiene packs. This is their rack. That's their storage. Couples and pets will be allowed at the Midway shelter. The structure is being provided by the Lucky Duck Foundation. It's costing the city $4.8 million to keep open through next June. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. A small plane crashed off a runway at Naval Air Station North Island. The plane crashed around 1.15 this afternoon, coming to a rest on the San Diego Bay shoreline at the edge of the water. A base spokesman said the civilian aircraft was operated by a military contractor. It was unclear what caused the crash, but there were no reports of injuries and only minor damage to the plane. Congress is considering a pair of bills to streamline the immigration process for Afghan refugees. A year after the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, KPBS reporter John Carroll tells us much of the progress for those refugees is because of work done by San Diegans. Kabul, Afghanistan, one year ago. After 20 years, the Biden administration had decided it was time to leave. And though about 120,000 people were able to get out, many more were left behind. A lot of them people who helped the U.S. in one way or another during the war. We have a shared commitment to helping Afghan allies who have stood with Americans for 20 years through our longest war. That commitment has been Sean Van Diver's life for the past year. As Afghanistan was falling, the Navy vet founded the nonprofit Afghan Evac here in San Diego. At San Diego City Hall today, Van Diver shared his personal story of what motivated him to make this his work. When my buddy Lucky texted me and said, Brother, I'm stuck on this mountain in Ergun. I think I'm going to die. We're running out of ammunition. Will you please grant my last wish and help my family get back to San Diego? So when we found out that my father was stranded, we immediately contacted our friend Sean and other volunteers to help out. Afghan Evac was able to get Alina June Nawabi's father out of Afghanistan. Now, she and everyone gathered here are behind an effort to get Congress to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. It's similar to legislation passed following past conflicts. We did it with the Cuban Act, with the Iraqi Act, as well as the Vietnam Act. And we're hoping to do the same thing for the Afghans. The Biden administration received bruising criticism for how it handled the pullout from Afghanistan. But Van Diver says the administration's new plan, Operation Enduring Welcome, makes some welcome changes. Uh, no longer will Afghans arrive here in a temporary status. They'll arrive with a durable, uh, long-term status and a pathway to becoming full American citizens. The Afghan Adjustment Act now sits in Congress, awaiting passage in the House and Senate. There is one provision of the Afghan Adjustment Act you might call preventative. It establishes a task force that, among other things, will work to ensure that what happened with the refugees this time never happens again. From downtown, John Carroll, KPBS News. Britain is marking its first full day in more than 70 years without their queen and ushering in a new era. King Charles III addressed the country laying out its new family order. This as ceremonies begin to pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. More now from reporter Isabel Rosales. A country in mourning, ushering in a new era as a new British monarch takes the throne. He will abide by the Constitution in a very faithful way. He'll follow in the Queen's footsteps. On Friday, in his first address as head of state, King Charles III bidding farewell to his mother and honoring her historic legacy, saying, quote, Queen Elizabeth, 
was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. It comes on the same day King Charles meets with the newly appointed Prime Minister, Liz Truss. And as mourners around the world pay the respects of the longest serving monarch in history, who died Thursday at age 96. Large crowds gathered outside St. Paul's Cathedral, where family members, lawmakers, and diplomats gathered to pay tribute. I can't explain to you how I feel. I feel as though someone close in my family has passed. Quite emotional, and I think it's going to be very different without her. As the country and the British Commonwealth adjust to a new reality, some have mixed feelings. I'm not like the biggest fan of the Queen or just like the monarchy in general, mainly to do with like British, like colonial history. While others look forward to having a king on the British throne for the first time in more than 70 years. I think he's probably more ready for it in the last 15 years than he, than he probably, probably was in his, in his younger years. In London, Isabel Rosales, KPBS News. A voter registration drive in the South Bay this week targeted students at Southwestern College. And this afternoon, potential young voters got a reminder from California Secretary of State who spoke on the power young people have in this November's election. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez was there. This is Democracy in Action, the setup for day three of a voter registration drive here on the campus of Southwestern College. It's sponsored by the Associated Student Organization. Leonardo Venegas is the ASO president. The ASO was making sure that Southwestern College as a whole had a bigger voice in the community. Of course, we're very involved. We are the community. After all, we are a community college. But I felt like since the pandemic, we really haven't been having a voice. It's the only way you're really going to be heard effectively is to vote. When you don't vote, you give up your power. As Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber is responsible for protecting the integrity of 22 million votes in California. She is the first African American to hold that position, and she has led the way to registering 900,000 college age voters this year alone. Southwestern College is her latest stop on a campus tour to get even more voters. This is your moment. Where's your courage? Where's your courage to stand up and fight? Where's your courage to get out there and register people to vote? Where's your courage to defend the democracy, the right of all of us to have a right to vote? Students here at Southwestern College are serious about their political voice. Secretary Weber's appearance marks the end of a week of heavy hitters who came to campus to listen to what students have to say. These pictures capture moments with San Diego Representative Sarah Jacobs Wednesday as students were willing to stand in the blistering heat for the chance to be heard by the U.S. Congresswoman. Yesterday, Juan Vargas, representative of the 51st U.S. District, visited a Southwestern College classroom and met with students one-on-one. -on -one. Over the past three days, more than 50 students here have become newly registered voters. The most important tool we have is voting. Yes, uh, using your First Amendment to go out and protest is a very influential part of it, but activism without voting, they, they have to complement each other. Secretary Weber remains committed to the U.S. democracy, despite its challenges in the past few years. Our democracy becomes weakened by people's negative comments about it's, it's not real, it doesn't work, it doesn't, all those kinds of things. But it has survived all of these years through the difficult challenges that it's faced, and it's a, really the best system we have. This is Democracy in Action. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. This November, California voters will be asked to invest in the arts in our schools. Prop 28 would require the state to set aside a share of its revenue for arts and education classes. Cal Matters reporter Joe Hong explains. When school budgets are cut, art and music classes are often the first to go. But a coalition of educators, labor groups, musicians, and Hollywood actors say arts and music are just as important as science, math, and reading. In November, California voters will decide if the state's yearly budget should mandate about $1 billion more for arts and music education. Hi, I'm Joe Hong. I'm the K-12 education reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Proposition 28 in a minute. Today, the state requires all of California's public school students to get some form of art instruction. But the quality of education can vary based on where you live. So Prop 28 was designed to give more money to districts that serve more students living in poverty. 
This measure won't raise taxes, but it will affect the budget. By law, California guarantees that about 40% of the state's general fund goes to education. Prop 28 would add 1% to that and dedicate it to arts instruction. For next year, that comes out to about an additional $1 billion. Districts would need to use most of that money to hire teachers for art, music, or drama. Supporters of the measure say students need the space to express themselves now more than ever to overcome the mental health challenges brought on by the pandemic. The money would come out of the state's general fund, which currently has a surplus of nearly $100 billion. So for now, supporters say they don't anticipate any cuts from elsewhere in the state budget. Heading into the fall campaign, no individual or organization was spending money to oppose the measure. So vote yes if you want California to give more money to schools for art and music. And vote no if you don't. To learn more about this proposition and others, visit calmatters.org. And a reminder to check out the KPBS Voter Hub. We also have a version for our Spanish-speaking audience. You can find it on our homepage or by going to kpbs.org slash elections. The killing of a resident at an El Cajon nursing home raises questions about why the facility admitted a patient with a long history of severe psychiatric illness and allowed him to stay even though he had reportedly assaulted other residents. In the second of a two-part series, KPBS investigative reporter Amita Sharma examines this case. And we have a warning that this story contains graphic descriptions that some audience members may find disturbing. That's my papa. The warning to Sally Renee Johnson Kamselman in mid-2021 could not have been more ominous. Her 90-year-old father was being treated at Sharp Grossmont Hospital when a staff social worker warned her against returning him to Avocado Post Acute Nursing Home in El Cajon. She said, you don't want to send him back there. It's a terrible place. The public record supports the social worker's perception of Avocado. More than 600 complaints have been filed against Avocado since 2019. And in April, federal regulators moved to decertify the 256-bed facility, citing its failure to keep residents free of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Weeks later, they reversed their decision, saying the facility had returned to substantial compliance. But back in July 2021, Johnson Kamselman says she had no option other than to place her dad back at Avocado from Sharp Grossmont. She had just a few thousand dollars a month for his care and little time to find an alternative. Six weeks later, her father, Robert Bradley, was dead, allegedly murdered by his roommate, Bezalil Jefferson. This beautiful man who pulled himself up by his boot springs during the Depression and made a life for himself. You want your dad to die peacefully. A caregiver found Bradley in his room at Avocado vomiting blood in the early hours of August 19th, 2021, according to state investigators. The autopsy report states Bradley had abrasions and contusions on his neck and died from strangulation. The San Diego County Medical Examiner ruled Bradley's death a homicide. Johnson Kamselman saw her father in hospice before he died. His tongue was swollen and purple and I saw scratch marks and gashes and abrasions around his throat. His whole neck was tremendously swollen. Jefferson admitted hitting Bradley before caregivers found him, according to El Cajon police records. San Diego County prosecutors charged Jefferson with Bradley's murder last fall. But Jefferson was deemed not mentally competent to stand trial and sent to a psychiatric facility in San Bernardino, according to court records. Johnson Kamselman and her siblings have filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Avocado. The lawsuit claims Jefferson suffers from severe chronic psychiatric illness and has been under multiple court-ordered conservatorships. The lawsuit also alleges that Avocado knew Jefferson had previously attacked other residents and refused to take his medication. Scott Fikes, a lawyer for Bradley's family, said an Avocado nurse's comments to El Cajon police are telling. She told the police that they were going to need their help. Uh, removing Mr. Jefferson from the facility um, and that she was concerned if they did it without police help, 
that he would whip their ass. Avocado, the California Department of Public Health, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services all refused to comment on Bradley's death. Lawyer Ernie Tosh is an expert on federal rules governing nursing homes. He says the facilities can admit mentally ill patients, but it can be fraught. So if the person is refusing to take their medication and you suspect they could become violent, in doing so, you have an absolute duty to the other residents to discharge that patient to protect the rest of your patients. Johnson Kalmselman says she's still haunted by how her father looked in his final hours. Part of me was going, oh my God, what happened? Oh my God, this is like a war victim. Oh my God, this is someone that's gone through Hell, and I wasn't there to protect him. That was the thing that bothered me the most. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. The U.S. Marshal Service is now offering a reward of up to $40,000 for any information leading to the arrest of Leonard Francis. The ex-Navy contractor known as Fat Leonard was set to be sentenced this month in a wide-ranging bribery scandal. And on Sunday, federal law enforcement learned Francis cut his ankle monitor and had fled home detention. The Malaysian businessman faces up to 25 years in prison. Governor Newsom has declared a state of emergency in three counties due to wildfires. One area, Riverside County, is where the Fairview fire has burned nearly 19,000 acres and is only 5% contained. In El Dorado and Placer, Placer counties, the Mosquito Fire has charred 6,800 and is 0% contained. The wildfire continues to threaten more than 1,000 homes and structures. Wind and rain has arrived from K, and K will continue to weaken slowly, but it will also continue to spread some wind and some rain across Southern California. So looking at our weather headlines, war windy, warm, and humid through tonight, and the risk for flash floods, especially inland areas and mountains. Cooler air will be arriving next week. Here's a check on our weather scenario for you. Rather unusual system here. K spreading its moisture up into our area here, so the risk for flash flooding could be uh, some mudslides and debris flows in burn areas. Uh, the wildfire relief, that's uh, they're going to be welcome, but we will have reduced visibilities and travel delays. And a lot of warnings are out there and watches. You can see the flood watches widespread inland areas through the mountains and across the high deserts. That's where we expect to see the most significant rain could see several inches here. Look at that. We are, we're painting in four to eight inches some of the mountains, so that will lead to flooding. It's been windy too, so we have some wind advisories and high wind warnings in through the, the evening hours. Winds gusting 40 to 60 miles an hour, maybe up to 80 miles an hour in some of the mountains. And offshore, we do have gale warnings in effect and also some rough surf, so there are some surf advisories. Now, Take a look at this. It's uncommon uh, for, for us here to see tropical cyclones. No record of hurricane force winds in California history. Only two tropical storms have hit California since 1900. And only seven tropical cyclones have brought gale force winds to the southwest. Well, for tonight, a little windy and wet here. Uh, be careful traveling. There could be some flooded areas, uh, some dangerous conditions. Temperatures tonight dropping down to 69 Ramona. Borrego Springs around 70 degrees. For your Saturday, we will see clouds and sun, humid conditions, showers, and a few thunderstorms around. And uh, the potential for some flooding will still be with us. Storms will decrease over the weekend. And it's drier early next week. Inland areas, same scenario, storms decrease. And then by Monday, we should see drier weather. In the mountains, a few storms in a Sunday and perhaps Monday. Otherwise, we'll be seeing some cooler air. And the deserts will start to dry out by Monday. It looks really nice with sunshine. And for KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Mark Mancuso. Get this. You can now go to Princeton University for free. The Ivy League School in New Jersey announced a more generous financial aid program, and to do so, your family must earn less than $100,000. Previously, students only qualified if their families made less than $65,000. Princeton says about 1,500 undergraduates will get the free tuition, room, and board.
A major movie theater chain with several locations in San Diego is facing bankruptcy. In the Friday Business Report, SDSU's Miro Kopik talks about the challenge for theaters to make money in the age of streaming. Cineworld, which owns Regal Theaters, is the second largest movie chain in the world after AMC. In 2020, they, they lost over uh, $2.7 billion, so close to $3 billion. Last year, uh, over half a, half a billion. So, you know, a lot of that debt is because of the losses they incurred during the pandemic. By declaring Chapter 11 bankruptcy, they're going to go through a reorganization, and they're going to be allowed to break some of those leases so they could leave unprofitable venues and and, and kind of focus on core businesses. They really started adding a lot of capacity. And what they're finding is right now today, uh, there's over 40,000 screens in the United States and Canada. Kind of the right size for movie theaters to be profitable is around 25,000 screens. So that means theater chains like AMC, Cineworld, and Cinemark, who actually own about half the screens in the United States, are really going to have to rethink how they promote value to their consumers or their customers. So fall is the time of year where it seems like pumpkin spice is in everything, and now it's even in the dictionary. Merriam-Webster tweeted about adding an entry for that seasonal object of love and hate. It defines pumpkin spice as, quote, a mixture of usually cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, and often allspice that's commonly used in pumpkin pie. Merriam-Webster's editor-at-large says words are only added to the dictionary when it's clear that they're consistently used. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.